Good evening. So we are continuing in our study of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And we are in chapter 14 tonight. And we'll, uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, but before we do that, just to review uh, what we saw last week in chapter 14. So far we've seen that some in the faith are weak and some are strong. And wherever we are in our walk of faith, we are not to be judging or despising our brothers and sisters in Christ about what and when they are doing, if they're doing it for the Lord. Amen. If one of us is working for the Lord, then the Lord will be the judge of his servant, and we are not going to be that judge. And whether we stand or fall, God is sovereign over the falling, and he is the one who stands us up. Having died on the cross for our sins and being resurrected from the dead, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and everyone is going to bow and confess exactly that, whether now or later. So, in the meantime, we are not to contribute to the stumbling of a fellow saint. God has declared what he has created and foreordained from before time itself. All of that is good and very good. But we must not grieve or destroy one who is weak in the faith and can only tolerate milk. And we shouldn't destroy them or grieve them by making them then drink that milk from a fire hose. Right? So, moving on, verse 16. Chapter 14, Romans, verse 16. I'll go into about verse 23. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat drink, but righteousness is peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, Paul says here that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The Old Testament had obligations, but the New Testament comes with privileges for the believer. Amen. The people of God are not to major on the minors. Right? We are not to get hung up in the little stuff. Those things that either the Bible is silent on or it's morally indifferent. So we should not allow secondary things like that to give occasion to others in Christ to condemn us for being loose or unloving. The gospel of Jesus Christ is altogether lovely and altogether glorious, and we should not let any aspect of our service to God distract from that. A brother or sister who is serving Christ is acceptable to God, and we should not be a pain in the neck of our fellow believers <laughs> about any of that. We're to make peace, Peace one with another and edify or build up one another. Now, just let an unbeliever, steeped and scarred in the ideas and vanity and corrupted worship of the world, walk into our church and see that happening, that righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And how could that not provoke an envy for the salvation we have, having trusted in Jesus Christ as the only name by which men are saved. Amen. So, um, this idea of majoring on the minors, not getting hung up in the little stuff, Jesus uh, addressed this directly. Uh, he did so when addressing the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Um, so he said to them, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. 
ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So what would happen in Old Testament times for the Pharisees had a dogged adherence to the law, and they looked for new and exciting ways uh, to be scrupulous, uh, thinking that that would get them more of the blessing of God. And what they would do, if they got anything extra, okay, if they were walking along and they saw a patch of peppermint uh, growing up in their garden, they would go and tithe a tenth of that peppermint uh, to the temple, okay? So when Jesus is talking to them about tithing out of their spice rack, what they're doing is tithing these little things, these little increases that God blesses them with. Amen. And Jesus says, you ought to do that, but you ought to do it and not forget things like judgment and mercy and faith, those things that are important to God, because if you miss those, you miss the whole point. So we might... Uh, you know, look at that, read that text, and say, go get them, Jesus. Uh, right on, <laughs> give it to the Pharisees. Uh, do it twice, right? Which he did. Uh, and then we, we go back, and what did he say in Matthew five twenty? For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness <coughs> of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of heaven. So uh, Christ there is, is telling us to be mindful uh, that even though the Pharisees uh, were really caught up in those minor things, uh, they did miss the point. But yet our righteousness to get into the kingdom of heaven must exceed theirs. Well, how do we do that? Well, we don't, right? We rely on the righteousness of Christ, all right? And so it's not the externals that matter. But the eternals, right? This idea of practical righteousness, having peaceful dispositions, and expressing joy in the Lord. Right? So more about this righteousness, peace, and joy. So what's the kingdom about? Well, Paul says here it's not about food and drink because God just doesn't care. He's not interested in that. So a Christian is not... Well, let me ask you this. Is a Christian going to undo the entirety of created order and the gospel of Christ for whom and by whom it was all made, is he going to do that by eating a pork chop? <laughs> Here's a stickier one for you. Is he going to undo the created order and completely throw off the gospel plan uh, if they belong to a denomination that uses actual wine for communion. Right? There's a debate about that, all right? Um, if that didn't make you cringe just a little bit as a Baptist, here's one for you. <laughs> Is it going to throw off God's entire plan if a Christian uh, down where I'm from in Louisiana has a Bud Light with his crawfish? Right? That's right. Um, is it? Right? Uh, now, some of you, so no, number one, no rocks or stones are being thrown at me yet. <laughs> that, that's a good thing, either because you're, you're pondering that or you're still wondering what's, what's crawfish. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a possibility, too. Um, but I'll give an illustration of that. I mean, I've been in church services where uh, they used wine for communion. Uh, and I did not turn into a pillar of salt, right? <laughs> Why? Because it was done before the Lord, right? There was a specific purpose to that, and that's what Paul is getting at that's here. Right. Um, when I was in high school, uh, they, uh, the local uh, Catholic outreach, there was a college town, there was a university town. Uh, my high school was on that, that campus, and uh, the, one, one day a week, uh, the, the Catholics would have service, they would have mass, and then there would be a dinner afterwards, right? What do you think was at that dinner? <laughs> it was not Kool-Aid, right? Um, so they, they had a party keg, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, right? 
Um, but you want to talk about decent and in order? They did, right? There was there was no riotous uh, riotousness about that. Um, now, in in some of our own conscience, uh, so we're not going to have a party keg at the smoke off, right, <laughs> on May twenty first. Right? I'm assuming that, right? So yeah. I, I do not think that that would fit with our conscience, right? Um, but we're not going to say, well, we, we would never have fellowship uh, with these other believers that think differently about those things than us, right? So do we all agree uh, that Christ uh, died on the cross, was buried, and resurrected again? That's a good place to start. Do we all worship the triune God, right? Is Jesus the Son of God? So these are the important things, right? right. So that's where we need to keep our focus. Amen. Um, how about working overtime on a Sunday to put food on the table, right? Uh, because that, that needs to be done uh, for the family. Or serving soup at an orphanage, right? So the examples could be multiplied over and over again. Uh, and, and those who are strong in the faith are not to be condescending, and those who are weak in the faith are not to be judgmental. Um, so... Also, the kingdom of heaven, it's not about uh, robes and candles or collars, right? Um, would we all uh, just crumble uh, if for some reason uh, Brother David had another conviction and he came in with a collar, right? But, uh, we, you know, we, we'd be looking for the charter forms for the Presbyterian Church of America or something like that. Um, you see, God doesn't not caught up in all of that, right? That's not what his program is. His program is bringing salvation to the entire world and redeeming humanity. Um, so uh, the kingdom of heaven also is not about uh, whether or not the worship has a good backbeat, right? The worship music. God's just not um, caught up in all that. All right. Um, and it's not about whether buying things from corporations or not is appropriate, right? If there was a hungry family and the only store open was Walmart, would we not buy food from it because it's one of those big evil corporations? That's not what the kingdom of heaven is about, right? It's not even about uh, meat offered to idols and avoiding that. Paul says, um, you know, some of the pagans um, that were sacrificing meat uh, and if it smelled really good and it was tasty stuff, a Christian can sanctify that, right? A Christian can walk up and say, I'll have a Baal burger. Now let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Um, but the kingdom of heaven is about our brother and sister. God does care, and he cares a great deal. So this center of the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. And that's a triad of blessings. That's not something that we just gin up to deliver and present to God, but that is God's work in us. So uh, Paul says that this righteousness, peace, and joy is where? Right? It's in the Holy Ghost. That's the environment that the Holy Spirit creates in order to work in. If it's any other kind of environment, the Holy Spirit's work is going to be limited to just the conviction of sin. Right? That's John 16, 8. Uh, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Okay. So God's the only one who gets to define righteousness. Righteousness is an expression of his holy character and is described in his law. Sin is, therefore, lawlessness. That's 1 John 3, 4. And it's nothing else. We don't get to take away from God's definition of sin, like the libertines, and we don't get to add or substitute like the legalists do. When we let God define what sin is, and what righteousness is, and we pursue peace, uh, that's just what Paul is talking about here. And the end result is joy. The joy is the work of God, 
right? It's not the joy of being right. It's not the joy of persuading people uh, to adopt what we think ought to be. It's not the joy of seeing others proven wrong. It's the joy of our <coughs> salvation, and that's the citizenship papers for the kingdom of God, right? So ultimately, Paul tells us it's better to avoid meat, wine, anything else than to, to offend a brother or hinder their growth and maturity in Christ. Choosing not to do something we might be otherwise be allowed to do is far better and is a small price to pay in order to care for a fellow believer, right, in verse 21. <coughs> so in verse 22, we may have liberty to enjoy certain things, but we don't need to flaunt that in the face of those who are weak in the faith, okay? We can do it later, in private, as Paul writes here, to myself before God. Amen. It is good to walk in liberty of Christ, not loaded down by unwarranted legalistic scruples or unnecessary burdens, right? It's like Pilgrim's pro Progress when he gets to set the backpack of burdens down. That was a good thing, right? But uh, we are not to be jerks for Jesus and be <laughs> condemned for causing another to stumble, right? Uh, happiness here is defined uh, as the one who can let it go and in just enjoy what God is doing in the life of another believer. Amen. Right? So in verse 23, we're back to the weaker brother. If he or she is hung up on eating or some other conduct that would violate their conscience uh, and they, they doubt it, right? And like, well, should I do this? Then they probably shouldn't, okay? Well, not probably shouldn't. They should not, right? <laughs> um, if they still partake, if they still do that in violation of their conscience, uh, then they're not acting out of faith and they have sinned, right? Uh, and then therefore they're condemned or in the KJV, damned, right? All right, um, let's move on. We'll try to get in the midst of chapter 15. Let's take the first seven verses, okay? Um, and this is still along the lines of these tensions, right? The reason the days and diet come up is because there's this tension between Jewish converts to Christianity uh, and the Gentile pagans who have converted into Christianity and they find themselves in this new thing called the church okay um, so it's going to be can't we all just get along uh, or alternate title for this section how to be mindful and <coughs> mouthy to the glory of God right? so uh, first seven verses of chapter 15 we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Right. Um, now I'm going to give you a little secret, something I didn't touch on last time. So weak in the faith, strong in the faith. Paul says here, we then that are strong, right? So Paul was in that camp of strong in the faith. One of the things that makes him strong is that what Paul brings in to his faith, into his Christianity, is his entire background of Judaism, okay? So the Jewish converts, they, they are steeped in scripture, uh, just like Stephen preached through the Old Testament, preached Christ that way, uh, that's what they came into. They could connect the dots. They knew uh, who the Messiah was and what it meant. Uh, the Gentiles are coming in without uh, that background so much, uh, but they do know what Jesus Christ, who he is, that he's the Son of God, and what he did on the cross, and that he was resurrected, and what that means for them. Okay, so... Uh, the, the Jewish converts had a bit more foundation. Now, 
That strength or any strength that God gives us should be used for the weak, not on the weak. Strength is not a gift that was given to you in order that you might waste it on yourself. You see, Paul is dealing here with a very basic problem of selfishness uh, of the believer. Okay, so that is a problem that can creep up, and that's contrary to true Christian love. Every one of us, and not just some of us, should therefore use whatever strength we've been given in order to please our neighbor such that they are edified. And that's in verse 2. So why? Why should we do that? Well, we're Christians, and we follow the example of Jesus Christ. You see, Christ did not do what he did to please himself. Rather, he did it to please the Father. Uh, no believer has ever given up anything good to follow Jesus. Right? What we gave up was our own self-righteousness, uh, also known as filthy rags. Jesus made the sacrifice, not us. We're baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection, and only then are we able to pick up our cross and follow, to die to self, or to mortify the flesh. Uh, then in this section, Paul goes on to quote Psalm 69, 9, making the point that Jesus was willing to suffer insult for the sake of God, verse 3. And of course, he did so on our behalf as well. That which was written down beforehand in Scripture was written so that through patience and comfort in those Scriptures, we might have hope. Hope in what? Right? Hope that we might learn this lesson, the very thing Paul is talking about right now. God is the God of patience and consolation, and so he's the one to give us the patience and comfort. The God of patience and consolation can bless us by making us like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus in verse 5. <coughs> this like-mindedness is exhibited by means of one mind and one mouth in glorifying God, who is the Father of Jesus, and receiving one another as Christ received us. And that's how chapter 14 opens. Right? Uh, and here it is again. Uh, so when we receive one another in this way, one mind, one mouth, glorifying God, it's a way to tune up the orchestra of all these saints singing and serving in harmony so that we might glorify God together. Right? Paul says, what was written aforetime? Right? What's that? Before. So the Old Testament. Right? Those scriptures that came before, that was all written for our learning. Uh, and again, those uh, in the early church, those Jewish converts um, kind of brought that knowledge with them uh, into their new life in Messiah Jesus. Right? Now, knowledge of the word here produces wisdom, patience, and hopeful comfort. Right? Through his word, God also gives us endurance and encouragement. And so it was comforting to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, right? Luke 24, 27. And God has planned, promised, and preordained that <clears throat> he has it all in his hand, and the same should be comforting to us today and give us hope each day from right now on into eternity. Um, as Paul is quoting uh, verse 69, it's probably worth highlighting uh, that Psalm 69, not verse 69, Psalm 69, uh, it makes an appearance throughout the New Testament. Right? Uh, they hate me without cause. Psalm 69, 4 is quoted in John 15, 25. Zeal for your house consumes me. Psalm 69, 9 quoted in John 2, 17. The reproaches of those who hate God fell on Christ. Um, here in Romans 15, 3. They gave the Lord vinegar for his thirst. That was 69, 21, quoted in John chapter 19. Uh, the rebellious Jews will have backs that will be bent forever. Uh, we saw that in Romans chapter 11, 9. And Judas would lose his position among the apostles. Psalm 69, 25, and that's in Acts 1 and 20. So Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah lives among his people. But people mean differences. Um, it's to be like-minded, not bird of a featherness, right? We are not to be uh, clones and robots and we're all thinking and saying the same things. No, uh, it's about focus and where our minds are, 
right? Are they on the things of God uh, as we work together? Um, you know, Paul's got this analogy of the body of Christ, many members, one body with Christ as the head working. Uh, and here he brings up the mouth, okay? Um, so with one mind and one mouth, glorify God. I'm going to give this to you. This is from William McDonald's Believer's Bible Commentary. There are four mentions uh, in the book of Romans uh, that form this outline of a well-saved soul. So, at the beginning, his mouth was full of cursing and bitterness, Romans 3, verse 14. Then his mouth was stopped, and he was brought in guilty before the universal judge, 3, 19. Next, he confesses with his mouth Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, 9. And finally, his mouth is actively praising and worshiping the Lord in harmony and accord with fellow believers. Here in 15, verse 6. Amen. So. Um, so Paul shared two sources of spiritual power that we must draw if we are to live to please others. The word of God, verse 4, and prayer, verses 5 and 6. We must confess that we sometimes get impatient with younger Christians, just as parents become impatient with their children. But the word of God can give us the patience and encouragement that we need. Paul closed the section uh, by praying for his readers, that they might experience from God that spiritual unity that he alone can give. And that suggests to us that the local church uh, must be steeped, must major in the word of God and prayer. The first real danger to the unity of the church came because the apostles were too busy to minister God's word and pray, Acts 6, 1 through 7. When they found others to share their burdens, they returned to their proper ministry, and the church experienced harmony and explosive growth. The result of this was glory to God, here in Romans 15, 7. But disunity and disagreement, they do not glorify God. They rob him of his glory. Abraham's words, words to Lot are still applicable to us today. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, for we be brethren. Genesis 13, 8. The neighbors are watching. Abraham wanted them to see that he and Lot were different from them because they worshipped the true and living God. In his prayer in John 17, Jesus himself prayed for the unity of the church to the glory of God. So, we receive one another, we edify one another, we please one another, all to the glory of God. Amen. Um, I think we'll, we'll stop there. And, uh, and we'll be on hiatus from the book of Romans till June-ish. Right. So, we've got lots of activities.